Right now, they will tackle tough times in California. The economic troubles facing San Diego will be the focus of Mayor Jerry Sanders' annual State of the City reports a 60% hike in rapes where either one or both people... ...they'll track the progress of 50 sarcoma patients using... From the KPBS studios, this is San Diego Week. Good evening, I'm Alison St. John. Gloria Penner has the night off. Thanks for joining us. Events in Egypt are gripping the world. We'll hear from two San Diegans intimately affected, plus learn how the turmoil could affect other Middle Eastern countries. Then more guns are smuggled into Mexico from California than any other state, but measures to stop the flow are being blocked. A surprising number of families have children with autism. Businesses are stepping in to help. And we'll meet a new member of San Diego City Council. That's coming up on San Diego Week. But first, the headlines. Amitha Sharma joins me from the KPBS News Center with the top stories from this week. Amitha. Thank you, Allison. Egyptians in San Diego rejoiced today over Hosni Mubarak's resignation, celebrating with a rally and visits to local mosques for Friday prayers. We never lost hope. We never lost faith. From day one, we knew this was going to happen, and it was just a matter of time. Many said they expect an era of transformation where ideas on how to pull the country out of a stagnant economy and transition into a true democracy are freely exchanged and applied. Some local Egyptians said they would consider returning to their homeland to help rebuild the country. A federal investigation this week showed no flaws in Toyota electronic systems that could trigger sudden acceleration. Even so, the government wants all new vehicles to be equipped with brake override systems. A CHP officer and his family died in a crash here when the Lexus they were riding in could not be stopped in 2009. A holy man who preached at a La Mesa mosque and was arrested by San Diego police for soliciting prostitutes is now America's most dangerous threat. Counterterrorism officials say Anwar al-Awlaki, the former imam at the Rabat Mosque in La Mesa, is more influential than Osama bin Laden in inspiring terror plots. And the San Diego police officer is under investigation after a woman accused him and a female companion of rape. Police officials say the man has been suspended without pay and has turned in his badge and gun. Allison? Egyptians make up one of the large Arab populations in the United States, and California has the highest number of Egyptian Arab immigrants of any state. Here in San Diego, residents with Middle East connections have been electrified by what's happening. Marwa Abdullah is co-founder of Egyptians Hope for Freedom. Shireen Tiab is an Egyptian-American who has lived here for the last 20 years. So I'd like to ask both of you, first of all, Marwa, how do you feel about the enormous amount of protests in the square and the results that have come about? You know, I'm so proud of the Egyptian, you know, community there who has stood up for their rights. And I'm so, so overjoyed with the news we heard today. Just elated. And Shireen. Um, I agree with Marwa, and what makes me even more proud is the fact that it was so peaceful. Not one of these protesters, and it's been over 18 days, and they're in the millions ever used violence or force. Now, Marwa, you have co-founded this organization. Tell us what it's about and why you decided to found it. Sure. Egyptians Hope for Freedom came about when a group of local San Diego Egyptian Americans said, you know, what's going on in Egypt, especially in the beginning of the protests when we saw the, uh, the police beginning to use force and the internet being cut off and the cell phones not being reliable sources of communication. We felt like you know, we're over here. We have to make our voices heard and, and, and say, you can't do that. Don't take away those rights and allow people to voice their opinion. So we founded this group, started raising awareness, saying, you know, we demand justice for people. We demand them to be able to have a voice and, and you know, trying to give as much support as we could to everyone over there. So you've lived here most of your life. You've lived here for 20 years. What is this strong connection that you still have with Egypt? Why do you have such a strong connection with with I your think country. anyone who's visited that country can understand how warm and hospitable Egyptian people are. When you go there, even if you've lived several places in the world, you feel like you're at home. But for the last several decades, I think the government has suppressed people so much that that 
that warm hospitality has begun to diminish. People have lived in fear for so long. Now, you know, we're hoping that we can return to kind of the, the, the normal way that things were. And Shireen, you too, you have family in Egypt. The I do have are family so and feel in Egypt. And, you know, it's always going to be my second home. I have a soft spot for it. I grew up there. I left there. I was 24. And, um, I mean, everything that happens in Egypt always interests me. And I agree with Marwa that lately it's been getting from bad to worse. And I'm really happy because after the people went up in the square, they went back to their normal Egyptians with loving each other, caring for each other. And to me, really, that was the biggest thing ever out of that. Have you spoken much to your family back at home? Have conditions changed for them much? How has it been for them? Today, I spoke to my, spoke to my in-laws. They are just ecstatic. They are so happy. Um, they haven't really went out yet in the streets, but they are just happy. They're and I am happy for them. Now, Marwa, you are a Muslim and you are a Christian. I just yes. wondered, what do you feel about the role of the, the Muslim Brotherhood in this whole uh, revolution? They have played a role and they may play a role in the future. You know, Marwa. I think that there's been a lot of talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. And unfortunately, sometimes we look at individuals and, and try to see them as representative of a larger group. And I don't think that we should necessarily look at the Muslim Brotherhood as representative of Egyptian population at all. I think they have maybe 20 or 30 percent um, of support of, of the society at large there. There are a lot more Muslims in Egypt who just want a decent life and who want to follow the teachings of Islam in a peaceful way. And the teachings of Islam say that Muslims and Christians should live in peace without any problems. And so I don't think we have to worry about the Muslim Brotherhood causing any kind of difficulties in Egypt. I think that Egyptian society is much more moderate. Uh, and what sort of role do you think that the United States should play in the coming days, just briefly, Shireen? Um, I would really like them to support whatever the government, the people would choose. Mm -hmm. And I really have big doubts that they will choose the Muslim Brotherhood. And I would really you started the sentence by saying you give them credit for this revolution that is not their credit they should never take any credit for this revolution it was done by youth across the board from all walks of life they wanted to join in it's their opinion but they are not the major force behind it thank you so much for bringing us your perspectives you. Shireen and Marwa yeah, thank, thank you. you thank you Alison thanks for having us Events in Egypt raise questions about a possible domino effect in the Middle East. How will the toppling of Mubarak's regime affect regimes elsewhere? Avi Spiegel is Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of San Diego. He's writing a book on the next generation of political Islam. So Avi, thanks very much for joining it's us. It's great to be here. So now you do not think that there's going to be an overwhelming uh, overhaul of countries around the Middle East as a result of what's going on in Egypt. Why not? I, I don't. I think that for any Middle East expert, the rapid and dramatic events of the last few weeks demand a certain amount of humility on our behalf. And it's extremely difficult to make predictions. However, I do think that, that we can say with a certain degree of confidence that uh, there are certain regimes in the region that are more vulnerable than others. For example, I think that the republics, the presidential republics in the region, are more vulnerable than the monarchies. And why is that? Well, the, authoritarian, the purely authoritarian regimes in the region can really be kind of set, split up into those two. And I think that the monarchies, for example, Morocco, Jordan, all of the, re all the countries in the Gulf, minus Iran and Iraq, um, they have a strong cultural uh, hold on power. They have a strong political hold on power. And in the case of the Gulf, they've taken care of their citizens better economically. Um, for example, the king of Morocco is also the commander of the faithful. Um, claiming direct descendants from the prophet. Um, so those leaders have a strong hold on power. And I think what the citizens in those countries are hoping for is more parliamentary reform rather than presidential reform. So in the case of Jordan, for example, King Abdullah is talking about a more powerful prime minister. Uh, the citizens of Morocco are talking about following the Spanish model. So you still have the king, but you have a stronger prime minister that has more power. Because right now in Morocco, for example, the king still has the power to appoint the prime minister. So which of the republics, which are the ones you think are more likely to change, are the ones that are perhaps more vulnerable to these winds of change? Right. So we're looking at about five presidential republics in the region. So Tunisia has already fallen three weeks ago today, uh, Egypt, and then Yemen, Algeria, and Syria. So Algeria uh, slotted to have major protests tomorrow. 
Uh, the president of Algeria has held power for 13 years, Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Uh, he's 75 years old, and uh, he also is concerned about the military's power, like we're seeing the military uh, emerging in Egypt. So I think Algeria is a place to look at. I think that Yemen, um, the president there has already said that he'll step down by 2013, uh, but it's unclear whether or not protesters there are going to be okay with that. Um, and then the case of Syria. Syria, um, the Assad family, uh, in many ways resembles a monarchy. Uh, they have uh, total cultural control over the country, political control over the country. Uh, however, uh, they also hold sham elections and they repress their people just like the other presidents in the region. So they also are vulnerable. And I think a lot of people in the United States are, are wondering about the role of the, the Muslim Brotherhood sure. in all this. Sure. What would you say their role might be? I think the hope is that in a future Egypt, and in a post-Mubarak Egypt, that the Muslim Brotherhood will be one party of many. And that they will have a voice, but they won't be the only voice. They've managed under Mubarak's regime to be the best organized opposition. Because all, all other oppositions were effectively completely banned. And so the Muslim Brotherhood showed a certain adaptability. However, in a post-Mubarak era where other parties come to thrive, other institutions and civil society emerges, the hope is that the Muslim Brotherhood is just one voice of many. And in a marketplace of ideas, they have a voice, but they won't be the voice. Well, Avi Spiegel, very good to get your perspective. Great Thank to be you here. so much. Thank for you so much, in. Allison. Thank you. When assault weapons are seized from Mexican drug cartels, they're often traced to gun shops in California and other border states. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms is asking for a new law that would require gun sellers in the four southwestern border states to report when a customer buys two or more semi-automatic weapons within five days. But the plan has been placed on hold. KPBS border reporter Amy Isaacson has been covering the story and she joins me now. So, Amy, how, do we, how much do we know about how many guns are actually smuggled into Mexico from the, these states? There's no way to really know how many guns are smuggled down because they're hidden. But what we do know is that the ATF director said that in 2010, of the guns that were traced in Mexico, 55,000 were tied back to U.S. gun shops, and that's about 70 percent. And that the four border states along the southwest are the top providers of those guns. And I think it's important to point out that Mexican criminals often look to the U.S. for guns because gun laws in Mexico are extremely strict and citizens are not allowed to buy or possess these types of big heavy machine guns that they buy in the U.S. So how does the Bureau of uh, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms keep track of what's going on now? And that's just the problem is that they really don't have a way to be able to track it. They say that they find out about these semi-automatic that have been bought in the U.S. once they end up at a crime scene in Mexico and are then traced back to the U.S. And that's because there's no reporting requirement. So you could go into a gun shop in Arizona, ostensibly, and buy as many semi-automatic weapons as you pleased, and then there's no reporting requirement for that gun shop to notify ATF that someone has come in and done that. And that's different than handguns, where gun shops have to report back to ATF if they sell two or more to the same person within five days. So what is it they want to change? So they want to create a reporting requirement. So they want, similar to handguns, if someone comes in and buys two or more in the space of five days or less, that they have to notify ATF. And they say that ATF says that, you know, this is a proactive approach. So that if something generates, they can have a lead at the beginning instead of working backwards to try to figure out how did that gun end up at a crime scene in Mexico. And how have the gun shop owners responded? I talked to a handful here in California, which is a little bit different because the gun laws are a little different um, in the state, but California and Arizona. And some said this is our responsibility as gun shop owners. Some said we already do this for handguns, so we don't see it as a problem for semi-automatic weapons. And others said this is a burden. We don't want to file this paperwork. And some said this opens us up because if we don't file this paperwork correctly, then ATF can come and sanction us. Now, the NRA the National Rifle Association, big gun lobbyists, have said that they will try to do everything they can to stop these kinds of measures, and they see them as a pretext, really, for Obama to the Obama administration to crack down and register guns. And in the few seconds we have left, what, what is the White House's position on all this? Well, ATF was trying to pass this reporting requirement as an emergency measure, and basically the White House has said this is not an emergency. They want 60 days and 90 days of discussion, public comment, and then it's expected that they will come out in April with a decision. 
And a quick question, why is it that the cartels don't buy guns in Mexico? So the gun laws are extremely restrictive in Mexico, and according to Washington Post, there's one gun shop in Mexico that's run, run by the military, and that is it. So they just aren't available, and you aren't allowed to have the kinds of weapons that cartels want. Amy, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. A restaurant in Del Mar is the first in the county to offer autism-friendly dining. KPBS reporter Peggy Pico says the restaurant is one of several local businesses reaching out to autism families. Ready? Okay. Jingle, jingle bells, bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Singing a song on top of a small dirt mound in her backyard, Sofia Gonzalez sounds like a typical four-year-old, until you listen closely. <laughs> Sofia has autism. She was diagnosed just before she turned two. So much fun to get. Some of the moms that I knew had noticed that Sofia didn't answer to her own name and that she really wasn't verbalizing that much. Her parents, Patty and Sergio Gonzalez, took Sofia to the pediatrician. The doctor asked me, you know, well, how many words is she using? About between eight and ten. And um, she looked very worried and concerned, and she went from the happy, smiley doctor that she always is and got really serious with us and said, you know, we need to have her screened for autism. She should be using between 50 and 75 words by now. Delayed or absent speech is a hallmark sign of autism, a brain disorder that disrupts a child's behavior and ability to communicate. About 1 in 110 American children have some form of autism. Symptoms include poor or non-existent social interaction, little or no verbal and nonverbal communication, repetitive behaviors, and sensory sensitivity to things like sound, light, and touch. These are the types of issues that make it difficult for families like the Gonzaleses to go out to eat. You know, I like the moons over Miami just like everybody else, you know, but <laughs> there are days where, you know, sometimes Sophia's just kind of, you know, she's a little, uh, you know, out of control and, and we don't go, you know. That's beginning to change. Turn it around to a positive. Thanks to people like Robert Stang. He's the manager at the Denny's restaurant in Del Mar. I had seen a new segment um, on TV about a restaurateur in New York that had one night that was set aside for uh, children with autism and their families, and I just thought that was a really great idea. Recently, Denny's became the first and so far only restaurant in San Diego to designate an autism-friendly dining room. 22 families of children with autism filled this half of the restaurant on opening night. I'm really into the whole uh, social responsibility thing, you know, and giving back and just being nice. And I think everybody should, you know, try to do a little bit more to help each other out. And so this is one way that our store is trying to do that. The cook and servers got a list of special dietary needs and changes in the kitchen were made. There was no extra charge for the meals or the room. Denny's plans to offer these special nights for autistic kids and their families once a month. I think it's good for business. I think it's good uh, for the support that the families need. And I think it's great for the kids. Shirley Fett, president of the Autism Society in San Diego, says other local businesses like the YMCA, Aqua Pro Swim School, and AMC Theaters also cater to people with autism. And then we have the AMC theaters. There's two locations, Mission Valley and um, South Bay, that do a once a month what's called a sensory friendly film. They turn down the sound a little bit because our kids are really sensitive to sound. They turn down the lights. Patty Gonzalez says it's these gestures of support that touches her most. It's uh, how big of a deal it is that there's, there's, there's those supports in place because it has made all of the difference in our family. A difference seen in Sophia's ability to kiss her dad, play hide and seek, and pose for the camera. Cheese. Bye, Peggy. And even say goodbye to newly made friends. Bye bye. Goodbye, KPBS. San Diego City Councilwoman Lori Zapp was elected to replace Councilwoman Donna Fry, who was termed out of office to represent District 6, including Mission Valley, Claremont, and Linda Vista. I spoke to her earlier about her goals.
So, Councilwoman Zapp, thanks very much for joining us. Now, this is technically a nonpartisan political position, but your predecessor, Donna Fry, was a Democrat. You're a Republican. How will your presence on the board change the way the city approaches solving the budget problem? Well, I'm not so sure it has anything to do with our party affiliation. I think it has um, more to do with just um, where, what we believe in and, and what's important to us. And so right now what's really important to me and to the people out in the community is somebody who's going to fight hard to reform our pension system, somebody who really believes like I do in bringing competitive bidding to support services so that we can free up more money for core services like public safety, that, which is paramount and you know, one of the things that we should be doing well and have a lot of resources for. And also, uh, because I have come from a small business background, my motto is, what can we do to help you create one more job? And so these are the things that resonated as I was campaigning out in the community. And I think if we can do those three things, it'll go a long way, a long way to solving a lot of our budget problems. Now, during your campaign, you did talk about getting quality jobs for San Diego. How is that consistent with supporting Walmart, who is wanting to build a superstore here in San Diego? Well, it, again, it's, it's about a philosophy. It's about government interference and intervention. And I, I've been a small business owner, believe me. I understand um, fighting you know, uh, out there, the bureaucracy. I've been, you know, taxes, bureaucracy, litigation, regulation. So. Um, I've lived under that as a small business owner, and there's a niche for everyone. There is a place for small business. There's a place for Walmart. I don't th th you know, think that uh, it's mutually exclusive here. And so to me, it's about consumer choice, and it's about um, affordable groceries for people. In my district in particular, we have a lot of people who are in the military on fixed income, who are seniors. and you know, I shop at four different stores. It's about choice, and I just don't believe that um, government dictating where people should shop is, is a good policy. Now, also during your campaign, there were some issues that came up that may be unresolved in the viewers' minds. For example, you were very involved in a group that was against frivolous lawsuits, and yet you yourself, while you were in business, yeah. filed uh, nine lawsuits, some of them against your own family members. How, how do you reconcile yeah, that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting when you're in a campaign how people mischaracterize and grossly distort things. It's just um, amusing, I, I guess, but uh, it, it was just business lawsuits. Um, in fact, I knew that these lawsuits were there you know, well before I ran for office. And four of them, we were business owner, small business. And on occasion, there were vendors who just wouldn't pay us. They just refused to pay. We tried to get the money. And in the end, we, smi uh, excuse me, we filed small claims. In four instances, we won them all. In another instance, there were um, a claim for an insurance company. We had switched carriers. I know this is going to be difficult for people to believe, but the insurance companies didn't want to pay the claim. And so we, again, were forced to file lawsuits, and uh, we won that full judgment as well. And the other one was a family matter. It was really uh, well over a decade ago, and we had, it was between, you know, family members, and it was an internal dispute, and we filed as a defense. We did not file the initial lawsuit. So it was mischaracterized. These were just commonplace business lawsuits. Anyone in business understands this, and quite frankly, anyone who considers this, these petty has never been in business. And uh, so, you know, that's what that was about. It was just campaign rhetoric just meant to try to distort the facts. Okay, so turning to things that matters to business, taxes, fees, mm -hmm. you're against raising taxes, but you did vote for water fee increase and yet another one last month. Um, I noticed during the, the hearing that you did push forcefully for a state audit yes. of the Metropolitan Water District that's raising the cost of water to the city. Has your office followed up on that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we have the legislation ready to go. And we're looking for um, sponsors to introduce it into the legislature. So uh, this is such a complex issue. I mean, we're at the mercy. There's the Metropolitan Water District, and then the county, and then the city. This came from the regional, Southern California region, MWD. And this actually happened months ago. It was just, unfortunately for me, slated, you know, when I'm in office. But they were passing through these, um, their fee increases to us to the tune of $25 million a year. No matter what, these people were going to get their money from San Diego. And it was either coming from the rate increase 
or us having to even further defer uh, replacing sewage pipes and water pipes and even more uh, deferring of our infrastructure. Councilwoman Zapp, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And now here's Amita Sharma with an update on what KPBS is working on for next week. Coming up on KPBS News Monday, we'll take a look at Mexican rodeo. And on these days, we hear about questionable connections between staffers working for San Diego Congressman Daryl Issa and industrial firms that stand to benefit from his investigations. Allison? Thanks, Amitha. You can comment on any of the stories that you saw tonight by going to our website at kpbs.org SD Week. We'd love to hear from you. And here's a look at the weekend weather forecast. Don't forget the sunscreen. Thanks for watching and good night. <laughs>